Welcome to Ignite Your Confidence for women in leadership who want to speak up and stand out. I'm your host, Karen Laus. Here you'll get all of the tips and tools that you need to stand out with unshakable confidence. Let's jump in to today's episode. Well, we have one of my favorite people on the show today, Jennifer Hill, who I, I really want to share the story with, of how we met, but we will, but I'm going to wait and do that after you introduce yourself. So go for it. Tell us about who you are. Thank you for having me on the show. I'm really excited. So as you said, I'm Jennifer Hill. I am a hotelier by trade, <laughs> lifetime hotelier, and work for a data analytics company that serves the hospitality industry. I'm fortunate enough to work full-time from home where I live with my wife and our two cats in Northwest New Jersey. We love to travel. I love to read. We just uh, bought a home with a pool in the backyard. So that's how I'll be spending my summer. <laughs> Yay. I want to start with your mom because I love that story. Can you yeah. share a little bit more about that and how that led to your career? Of course. So I am able to uh, accurately represent myself as a lifetime hotelier because my mom, uh, when she was pregnant with me, was a banquet waitress at what at the time was a Holiday Inn in Chambersburg, Pennsylvania. And by the time I was a senior in high school, she had been promoted to assistant director no, sorry, assistant general manager in charge of sales. Uh, she had spent most of her career there as a director of sales, but I was around all the time. We were really lucky that it was a one hotel, one owner, uh, family oriented environment. So they somewhat reluctantly let me hang out at work a lot with my mom. And I reached a certain point where I was old enough to work and be paid for it. So I started working <laughs> for her. Uh, but there was a lot of unpaid labor up until that point, nothing too strenuous. You know, I had to file things when she was a director of sales and uh, learned how to type on a Holodex admin screen uh, <sighs> because it was just put me in front of a computer and it was, I'm old enough that there wasn't really a, an easy to access word processing program then. So it just brought up an admin screen in one of the, the programs and I would type away. Amazing. What What's the biggest lesson that you learned from your mom? I think just really, you know, I, I often say when my mom, when I talk about my mom and working in hotels, that it was a job for her. It was less a career uh, than, than it was a job that she needed to have out of necessity. And after I went to college, she switched careers, but she was always so dedicated and, and hardworking. And she did it without complaint uh, for very little money. And I think that, you know, without sort of having her be super direct, like you have to work hard and you have to do this and I'm doing this because it supports the family and just witnessing that and watching her do it and learning by example, uh, that's, that's the lesson. I think, you know, there's a quote, a pretty common quote around that um, I'm not going to be able to remember now, but it's something like, uh, I work so hard because I watched my mom do the same thing or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think, of, or I, I work so hard because my mom worked hard enough, you know, I have to kind of, I have to yeah. pay it forward. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that is the, the big thing. Uh, she was absolutely my mentor, specifically in the hotel business, but overall. Uh, so the first time when I was a general manager, I had to deal with bed bugs. My first instinct was to call my mom and say, what do I do? And, you know, I had worked with a lot of other people in a lot of other hotels, but in that experience, you know, in that instance, I was the one on deck for it. And I was like, I don't. And so. Wow. <laughs> I love it. It's not one on deck. I mean, it's such a good reminder of a job has to be done. And sometimes you're the one to do it, whether you maybe want to do it or not. And how yeah. old were you at the time with the bed bugs thing, for example? Um, I was 26. So I was a very young uh, first and only time general manager of a hotel, but it was in the, it was in the first year after my mom died. And so that was a tough oh. sort of transition to make, but I yeah. wanted to do well because, you know, I had all the tools and she had equipped me with them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's, that's a powerful legacy that she left that you're continuing yeah. to, to <laughs> live on. I love it. Well, let's talk about how we met. 
I want to go back to that moment because I feel like that was really pivotal for both of us. Mm -hmm. And I'm maybe making an assumption there, but I hope it no, was it certainly for was you. for me. <laughs> so do you want to share a little bit about that, the, the whole thing, or do you want me to? Uh, I'm happy to start start it off and then you can sort of jump okay. into your perspective because I think one of the things that I find remarkable about it and it certainly was pivotal for me too is that it was a spur of the moment decision uh, for me so I feel like it was really serendipitous so sometime early on in the pandemic uh, I joined a group of like-minded revenue generation professionals in the tech and SaaS space uh, which is primarily what our company does even though we serve hospitality clients and they had a group for women that met at 6 p.m. Eastern on Mondays. And I intended to go every week, put it on my calendar, set reminders, and then would usually wrap up my day at 5.30, 5.45, didn't feel like sitting at my desk anymore. And finally, uh, one day, I, thought, I saw the title of the session and that there was going to be a guest speaker. And I was like, you know what? This is what I need today. Uh, and... I'm not going to remember the session title specifically, but well, that now morning, because now, okay, I, but, but like that oh, morning, wait. I had taken um, a class uh, with Robin Arzon, who's Peloton instructor, and she had said something that I wrote down on my phone and then wrote it on a post-it note the, when I sat at my desk that day. Um, and I'll let you reveal that, but it was just perfect. And as I said, serendipitous. And I said, I'm gonna make this connection. And I was offered the opportunity to sort of explain why I had decided to join that day in my introduction. And that was the start of our friendship and the connection. And um, it was the first and only time I've ever attended that roundtable event. <laughs> so <laughs> well, me too, I will say, although obviously I came as a speaker. But it's funny because I was for a moment, I thought, what was the title of my talk? I was going to ask you what it was, but it was seven ways women give away their power and how to take it yeah. back. Now yeah. that I think about it, especially yeah. as you held up to the Zoom screen, a bright, hot pink post-it note that said, resist the urge to give your power away. And, talk and that's about what I needed to hear that day. And then it was just as I said, for the third time now, it was just incredibly serendipitous. And I think it's uh, really meaningful. Mm -hmm. Well, and our connection has been really meaningful to me along the years or now years, we can say that we've known each other. Yeah. And then very fun surprise to have you have that framed and present it to me when we met at mm -hmm. the HSMAI conference last June, 2022, yeah, last June. right? Yeah. Amazing. So I am very curious in the spirit of that related to giving your power away, what is an example that you'd be willing to share either where you did that and would like to go back, or if you have advice for other people of what they could do to take their power back? I think I have been I don't use this word lightly, but I, I think it's the the best word to describe what I'm going to say is I think I have been a victim of giving my power away for two reasons. One, I was a very young manager, very young leader. And I often felt like I sort of got to those roles and was promoted into those positions because I was talented and I was hardworking and I succeeded very quickly, but I also would often take a backseat um, to stronger, louder, more experienced voices. And the second area is um, my ego and my stubbornness. And if I didn't think I was going to get my way, or I didn't think that I could get others on board, I would just stop participating. I would stop participating in the conversation. I, I would give the power away. And in the moment that we met in that situation and, and sort of in that phase in that season of my life, I was finding myself doing that more and more it just didn't feel like it was worth it to fight. And it was in a professional capacity, just, you know, differences of opinion about how to approach things. And instead of really sitting down and taking an opportunity to think about how I could present my argument or just be willing to compromise or accept that maybe my option wasn't the best option. Uh, I was often just saying, fine, 
just sat back fine, kind of physically like wash my hands of it. And I recognized that that in that moment, and then over the last couple of years that I would, I did, I have done that all my life. Anytime there was friction, I would just say, that's fine. Have it your way. Uh, and then, you know, sometimes feel vindicated and validated when I was right, or I had the better idea, but it doesn't mean that we would have had the same result if we went with my idea first. A lot of times things require iteration. So in many ways, I feel like I let myself down, but I also let down people who were relying upon me as a peer, as a colleague, as a leader in those moments where I didn't say, no, here's, here's what I think and why it is sort of my position. And this is why we should do this thing, or this is the action we should take. And that has been um, something that I kind of constantly have to work on. Um, so for me, that's been the biggest one. I know it's not a really like specific concrete example, but it, like I said, in two, you know, sort of two ways, I feel like as a woman in business and industry, like kind of learn how to sit back and listen and not speak up. And then my ego got in the way a lot of the time. Well, I love that share. And thank you for telling us that because that is not something that people typically go to when they're talking about this, about ego. Like that's fascinating to me. Mm -hmm. And yet what, what was also an interesting and important thing to call out is that you acknowledge that other people were affected by that. And I think that's a really important thing for everybody listening to keep in mind that whenever we take action or inaction, we therefore affect, it's that whole ripple effect. We mm -hmm. can inspire people to speak up or we can inspire them to stay quiet. And obviously there's a time and a place to, to stay silent and that kind of thing. But I'd say more often than not, people hold back. And mm -hmm. that's certainly, I'd say more, well, certainly my story and definitely a lot of, a lot of people that I talk to. What advice would you give to someone who is trying to, I say, I shouldn't say trying to, but I say they're like attempting in their best efforts to speak up and get their thoughts out there. It's so easy just to say, do it, you know, and, <laughs> and I know that it's, um, it's cliche at this point, but I would say in a group, if you are in a in a boardroom in the proverbial boardroom and you know you have an ally in that room confide in them early you know prior to the meeting and say i would really like to present this idea or i you know might have a different opinion than so and so uh can you help support me in that moment mm -hmm. and i think having knowing someone is willing to support you whether you need it or not and then if you do need it being able to step up um you know having that allyship is a good place to start uh, in larger groups. And if it is one-on-one, -on -one, it is important just to do it. I think a lot of times it's not as uncomfortable as we expect it to be. And it always feels good, uh, even if it's maybe not the outcome that you thought you wanted or that you wanted. Uh, it feels like you've really accomplished something and then you can build on that. Yeah, that's a great example of not being attached to the outcome, what you said there, because it's so empowering. Same thing. Again, I'm mm -hmm. reiterating what you said, but I want to call out that the importance of not, it, it isn't about the, the results, even though of course we all want to get what we want, <laughs> but it's the practice. And this isn't a direct analogy, but it's top of mind. I did my six month dentist visit yesterday and I hate it. I'm not adverse and you know, get upset and need to be medicated, which is perfectly fine <laughs> if that is you. Um, but I, I, and I'll share openly, I did not have a good dentistry practice until the last few years of my life. And I just, I don't enjoy it, right? It's not an enjoyable thing. Uh, for me, it's particularly, it's just uncomfortable. Um, yeah. And they found cavities in it. And they were like, do you want to do it tomorrow at 6.45 PM? Do you want to wait until next week? Like, I'll just do it tomorrow and I'll just get it out of the way. And, you know, not every conversation is going to feel like going to the dentist, but I think in a lot of ways, it's a very universal experience and dread yes. that people have. And you like, I'm going to do it because I know that it's the right thing and it will prevent further problems down the road. 
And I whined a little bit about it last night. And I said to my wife, Dara, I said, I really don't want to go, but I want to make you proud because I'm taking care of myself for us. And so if you were married, you have a partner, you have kids, you have anybody, a creature, a living, breathing creature who relies on you. And that can even be yourself. Like sometimes you just have to do the thing, no matter how uncomfortable it is or how much you're dreading it, because it's the, it's the right, it's the next right thing. It's the next thing that has to be done. And I feel like people really blow up these conversations where they want to use their voice, like to this mythological, there's no way I can overcome this to just being like, just buckle up, get it done. Once it's over with, you'll feel so much better. Uh, and you might have to go back the next day and get fillings, or you might be good for six months. That's a just, great you... analogy. <laughs> I'm already thinking, Ooh, I like, I like what I'm thinking of the title for this episode. <laughs> it's so true. I mean, we have easier to than going things. to the dentist, right? <laughs> Well, and it does get easier. It's, it's amazing how it does in general when you speak up. And I remember the first time that I spoke up specifically teaching myself to say, here's my vote. And that was a total on the fly thing, but I thought I have to say this, but I don't want to just stick my head out there and say, here's what I want to do. And I remember distinctly how empowering it felt because after I said, here's my vote on this project or whatever it was that nobody died and <laughs> you know people didn't freak out of, Oh, I can't believe Karen, this or that. And it's so interesting, all these stories that we make up in our head too about mm -hmm. the thing and how much, how much easier it is, like you said, to get it done. And then you can move on the next time. And the next time, do you remember a time when you, wish specifically that you did speak up, but you didn't, and you'd like to go back if you could. Um, yes, I definitely have had situations in which I was sort of, for lack of a better way of putting it, and, and certainly to no offense to the people who were above and below me in these situations, but sort of middle management. Mm -hmm. So I would be interviewing people for our team who would report directly to me, but I didn't have the final say. And so even if that person who was interviewing with me wasn't interviewing with the person I reported to, you know, there were some uh, confirmation or approvals that had to happen. And I definitely had candidates that I didn't fight hard enough for that I think would have been good additions to the team. And a couple that I did and have grown and flourished in their career and provided a lot of great value to our team uh, once I got my way, which is sort of how I perceived it coming to be. And uh, I think was the perception at the time was that I got my way, but then that person turned out to be a gem and a great asset. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it was a positive experience overall, but I definitely know there were other times where I didn't speak up and say, no, we should give this person a chance. We can teach this skill, but they bring something intangible to the table that we need right now. And again, that's an opportunity where I let that person down and I let the rest of the team down because we went for the comfortable choice. We mm -hmm. went for the person who had more experience, even if they weren't the best fit. And that never plays out well on mm -hmm. uh, in team dynamics. What was the What was the root, would you say, for you of why you didn't? at that time feeling like I I didn't know better than the person oh. I reported to okay yeah you know what is another There's something they yeah. see that I don't sort of thing got it yeah and and that brings me to something that always surprises me about you and it's such a good reminder of how we don't know things under the surface with people <laughs> unless they share it and you are so openly vulnerable that I want to share how you talked about imposter syndrome for you and it is so interesting because you come across as so confident, like you seem just incredibly unflappable to me. And I, I felt that way pretty much from the beginning that I met you, the moment that I met you. So tell us a little bit about that, because I, I, that's such a relatable part of your story. I am the definition of imposter syndrome. I, um, I, you, so and I think it goes back, like being able to do this, it goes back to 
um, I'm thinking like I picture things and I have very visual memories. So I like picture things. Um, when I was growing up, the hotel where I grew up, vis visceral memories of this mm. area, but in the front desk and the hallway out to the lobby. And as you opened that door on the back, it was like, um, like a dressing room mirror it was meant to look like. And then on, it was a bumper sticker size and it said, you're on stage. It was a reminder when you go out that you, you know, in the, in the back office and, you know, you can vent and be frustrated and, you know, at the time, take your jacket off, loosen your tie, whatever it is. But when you went through that door and you were in front of guests, you were on stage. And I have been so shy all of my life and so not confident that I think that is like a core that's a core memory for me. That really helps me be built the way I am because I can turn it on and off. Uh -huh. um, especially as an introvert, I can force myself and it's not like I'm detached, but in a way it feels that way. Like I kind of have a show personality and then I have me. Um, and the older I get and the more comfortable I get, I think that, you know, those people are showing up together more often and they're both authentically me, but in that hotel where I grew up, there was a general manager there for five, six, seven years. I would leave my mom's office when he came in because I was so painfully shy. And this was, and this person was practically family. And I just wasn't used to being, he was really tall and I wasn't used to being around, you know, kind of these, I wasn't used to being around men, especially like giants. Uh, and I was just really shy. So I'd leave. Um, one of my first jobs outside of the hotel, I worked at a fast food restaurant and for two weeks, I wouldn't use the headset because I was so shy and nervous. Really? And I, the first time I cried and they said, okay, okay. And like how many 16 year old kids are waiting to get a job at a fast food restaurant? Like just say, sorry, you're not going to work out, move on to the next one. They gave me a chance to, to wear it, to get comfortable, to listen. And the first time I did it by myself, I was working early on a Sunday morning with one other person and the order had come in. And they had to be out doing the order because I didn't know how to do that. And there was no other option but for me to do it. And I did it. And I was fine after that. And that's another, like, I, wow. just, I did the thing. Just did it. Um, mm -hmm. I did it. But, you know, I I have hype me up playlists. I give myself, you know, pep talks. I really kind of, like, gear myself up. Um, and when I'm traveling and I'm speaking, you know, there are rituals that I have. Uh, you know, when I'm getting ready or I'm not a morning person, but I'll get up two hours before I have to get ready so that I can make sure, you know, I'm, I feel wide awake and I've eaten and I'm confident. Um, mm -hmm. And those are all things I think seem really small, but people don't realize because I am, I, I get that a lot. I get people saying, how are you so comfortable on stage? And um, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not. Well, that, that's such a good <laughs> reminder that you don't have to be comfortable. And most of the time we're not comfortable. I mean, if everybody just did what they were comfortable with, they were, nobody's going to grow. Right. So that, that does bring me to, I'd love to chat a little bit about improv. And I yeah. know that's a, a thing that we both share. And will you tell us a little bit more about that and how that's helped you? Of course. So I am nice am in my sixth year at my job. And when I first started, it was a business development. It was a sales role, which I had never been in before and had always said no to. I never wanted to train or transfer into sales because I didn't want to be told no. I didn't want to be sort of out vulnerably asking for something and whether it's personal or not being told no. And I knew within the first few weeks, you know, I was going to be on calls all day, every day. I was doing demos. I was learning a new product. I was learning mm -hmm. new terminology. And I am so hard on myself. So I knew that if I made a mistake on a call at 10 a.m., I would be done for the rest of the day. I would be forcing myself sort of to do the bare minimum for the rest of the day because that's how I had responded up until that point in my career was kind of just hide away, crawl under a rock until the next day, try again. And I knew I wasn't going to have that luxury because I needed to do four or five, six calls a day, whatever the case was. So I had been thinking for years at that point about trying improv. And so I decided just, I won't say it was on a whim because I think I studied the fine print, which was all of four sentences for three hours, but I did sign up for a beginner improv class, no show, no stage time. Um, that 
it started like the next weekend. Uh, and by the fourth week of that six week class, I had bonded with my classmates and we decided to go on to improv level two and then three and then four. Um, so, you know, I've studied everything from improv games, like you would, you know, see on whose line is it anyway, to a long form, which often leads to sketch comedy, you know, like people are familiar with Saturday Night Live and things like that. Mm -hmm. What do you think improv has, how do you think that that has served you best in your career? The basic principle or the, the major principle of improv that everyone knows is yes and. Uh, right. So yes, comma, and, and I think that comma is really important because it is acknowledgement of, yes, this is where we are, the comma and the, and take us to the next part of the story. And that was revelatory for me. It's like, I can't do anything about what I'm doing, what just happened, right? I can't change that, but I can change the next thing. And I can go with the flow. I can say, yep, that is the question that you asked me, even if I wasn't expecting it. So I'm just going to answer that and move on to the next thing. So the yes and principle, obviously, is, is one of the more transformative. But two other things for me is our improv coach slash teacher always, like, nobody cares. Nobody is paying attention in the way <laughs> that you think they're paying attention. Um, they're not criticizing every single word or syllable that comes out of your mouth unless you draw attention to it. And at the end of the day, they just don't want to be the people on stage. They're mm. amazed that you are on stage and they don't know what you're going to say next. Neither do you, but you don't know. They don't know. <laughs> so if you yeah. say the wrong thing, they don't know. Yeah. And it's okay to move on with that. Mm -hmm. um, but the last thing that I took away is sort of a companion to yes and, which is, if this is true, then what else is true? And in the improv world, you use that in a scene. If I say to you, oh, well, thank you, Mr. Jones. And you go, hold on. I didn't know I was a man in this scene. Why is she calling me Mr.? You have to immediately sort of do these quick calculations. Like, oh, I am a man in the scene. She's calling me Mr. It's being deferential. So if it is true that this is, I'm a man, and I'm being called Mr. Maybe we're at a school. So then we go, if that's true, then what else is true? School bell rings, you're dismissed for the day and you can move on with the scene and build the story around that. But that one hit home for me in such a way that with imposter syndrome and with negative self-talk and feeling not confident a lot of the time, I was like, if this is, I, I flipped it on its head. Like if I'm saying these things to myself, if this is true, then what else is true? You can't get to the, then what else is true? Because you, it, like, in my mind, at least it immediately flips me out of that. If you wouldn't say this to your best friend, you wouldn't mm -hmm. say this to your sister, you wouldn't let somebody say this to you. So why are you letting yourself do it? So if I say, oh, I don't know why they asked me to speak this year, you know, last year, nobody seemed interested. If this is true, then what else is true? And everything that happens in the, then what else is true, isn't true because I was asked to speak. I was asked right. to come back. I do still have the job that I had. I still have grown in my role. I still do have other opportunities. And it's just immediately like you can come up with the, the opposites of those things. Yeah. So. Yeah. I well, and I'm so glad you shared that part because I think that is super cool. The way that you've integrated that into your life and flipped it yeah. on its head. <laughs> well, is there anything that I haven't asked you yet that you want me to ask or that you want to share? Uh, not that you haven't asked, but I will just say I am an evangelist for improv. So find a class, take it. Don't be scared. Mm -hmm. I will say too, I will second Truly that. And yeah, I do think that is that people, well, there's so many reasons why to take it. But I remember when I was starting out in my communications career, Bert Decker, who founded Decker Communications, said it was the best communications course he's ever taken. And I don't know that most people would immediately think about it as a communication course, but that whole skill, particularly of thinking on your feet and the, and I love how you distinguish the yes and with the comma and the importance of that. There's so much value in that to help us to be more confident. And it forces you to practice it. I would say, you know, some of the responses that I get when I talk about having taken improv or early on, you know, people would say, oh, you want to be a comedian, do stand up. And like stand up is completely different than improv. 
Yeah. Uh, I'm not very funny, but I love doing improv and I got a few laughs here and there because I played like the straight guy to the other wacky characters. But, um, you know, I think it's interesting when people say, oh, they're not funny or it was the, it was the warm up exercises that helped me the most. Uh, sometimes I can be on a call listening to what a client is saying and writing something to someone else or in the time where we weren't on camera all the time, I would mute it and be listening and be able to respond more than, mm -hmm, but also have a side conversation about the next thing or what about, what do you think about this idea? Should we present it this way? And I absolutely credit an improv exercise for that. And there were mm -hmm. four of us in the group and we took turns. So if I'm the subject. I had one person here asking me really basic questions. What's your favorite color? Do you have any siblings? What are their names? This person was asking me simple math questions. What's two times two? What's three plus one? What's 10 minus 10? And then the person in front of me directly was making a movement, but not speaking. And so we were to be answering and, and they were asking the same question. What's your sister's name? What's your sister's name? Until they heard an answer. Didn't matter if it was the right answer because they don't know. But until they heard an answer, so you couldn't just be doing math and you couldn't just be answering the simple questions about your life, but you were answering those and they'd switch and then you were physically mimicking whatever the, the person in front of you was doing. And that practice just over six weeks forced me or helped me learn how to truly multitask in some wow places. I've never right? heard of that one. Yeah. Yeah. And you like, you know you're not going to do that on your own. You're not going to say, gather around. Here's the <laughs> exercise. You know, like you have to have kind of a structured classroom environment, I think, to take advantage of those types of things. And that's a really good reminder of that, the structure of, mm -hmm. yeah, giving that possibility to even see what, what truly does come out of it. Well, I so appreciate you being here today, Jennifer. It's such a fun opportunity to be able to connect with you. And yeah. I love all the things that you shared to specifically help us step into our own confidence. So are thank there you. any parting words that you want to leave us with? Just thank you and keep listening to this show so we get more show episodes. <laughs> I love it. I love, I it. love it. I'm like, I want more. <laughs> Yes. Yes. You heard her folks. Listen in. All right. Thanks, Jennifer. Great to have you as always. And that's a wrap of another episode of Ignite Your Confidence. I'm your host, Karen Laus. Thank you so much for listening. If you love today's episode, please subscribe and leave a review. It helps other people find the podcast faster, and it certainly helps me. If you're interested in more tips and tools around confidence, please join me over in my Facebook group called Ignite Your Confidence with Karen Laus. Remember, you too can stand out with unshakable confidence.